Next, we're going to have a, uh, three lawyers join us via Zoom to do a, a discussion on grain contracts and some of the issues that we all face this year. Um, APAS has long been an advocate for better commercial relationships between producers and buyers. Producers have long felt disadvantaged and without the proper tools to advocate for themselves when they are contracted. This year with the drought, we felt that, felt that particularly hard as production fell short of contracts and producers felt like they had little choice but to do what the grain companies said. Seeing this situation, the APAS board felt that it was time to bring together a panel of legal experts to discuss the issues with, issues with contracts, how producers can protect themselves and provide some background as, as we move forward with advocacy. I now would like to open the floor to our three lawyers. Are they on the line? Glenn Lacash from Miller Thompson LLP, Rochelle Blocker from McDougal Golly LLP, and Paul Wood from McDougal Golly LLP. I will ask the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Glenn. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Glenn Lacatch. I'm a lawyer uh, with Miller Thompson here in Regina. Uh, I'm a commercial lawyer and I've uh, practiced law for uh, a very long time. I won't tell you how long. Uh, as part of my commercial practice, I, I negotiate and draft uh, commercial contracts, including supply contracts. I have uh, drafted and reviewed many grain purchase contracts production contracts and other grain contracts uh, throughout my career. And so that's a summary of the type of practice that I have. Thank you, Glenn. Rochelle? So I'm an associate lawyer and uh, I haven't been practicing as long as Glenn has, but uh, I have been around since uh, 2015. I I'm not scared to put a number on it there quite yet. Um, so I practice primarily a, a litigation practice, and this brings me into a variety of different areas involving the ag sector and contracts. Um, so in addition to grain contract experience, I have been involved with seed development agreements, uh, issues arising from seed tags or, or pesticide labels, uh, spray drift claims, land use agreements, and employment contracts. Uh, throughout this time, I've acted on behalf of farmers, small business owners, and international corporations. And while more often than not, my involvement starts on the dispute resolution end, I have also been uh, a party to uh, grain contract negotiate or not contract negotiations. So, thank you, Rochelle. Paul, please. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Wood. I practice in uh, McDougal Gully's Regina office. Um, share some of my practice uh, in similar areas as Rochelle has described as well. I do uh, primarily defense litigation in terms of civil litigation involving grain and agricultural disputes. Um, I have a background in insurance law and uh, I also practice in criminal and quasi criminal uh, defense. Um, I grew up on a farm just west of Regina near Pence. Uh, involved a grain farm and an air spraying operation. So it's so any sort of agriculture issue is uh, definitely of interest to me. And I think um, the, the different areas I practice tend to all come up from time to time in, uh, in agricultural disputes. Um, so I'm definitely happy to be with you today and thank you for the invitation. Thank you all very much. And we appreciate you being here today. Um, we have a list of questions that we're gonna ask the panelists and then at the end we will have time for some questions from the floor so get ready for your questions producers first question is for you paul how can producers protect themselves and their businesses when signing contracts uh it's an excellent question i think the one sentence answer would be just know exactly what you're agreeing to um the, the slightly longer answer to that is of course, read, read the whole contract. And I know the, the reality of negotiating and agreeing to these contracts. So obviously isn't, uh, you know, you go in and sit down and pour through the contract before agreeing. These agreements are made on the fly, text message, phone call, email, whatever it may be, uh, with usually a signed copy of the 
or a written copy of the extra terms and conditions being mailed out and potentially agreed to or at least signed after the fact. Uh, so I, I would stress that it's very important to read those terms and conditions uh, in full. Um, each green buyer uh, would have kind of their own set of terms and conditions. They're all, they all probably cover similar areas, but would have unique factors about each term, um, specifically related to, you know, uh, whether there's act of God, frustration, um, extended delivery dates, jurisdiction, what happens in, in the event of a dispute. Uh, those are all very important and sometimes overlooked. And I would stress to uh, definitely read the whole contract and also don't assume that a contract you are agreeing to this time around is the same as the same company uh, from three, six, 12 months before. And also don't assume that it's identical or similar to uh, the terms and conditions you may have agreed to with a different buyer. Uh, so essentially just do your due diligence and know what you're agreeing to. And I think that would take care of a lot of the uncertainty. And if there are questions or if you're uncertain about any of the terms in there, it's best to follow up immediately with uh, the other party to clarify the term or get an explanation uh, that if there's a dispute later, the fact that you asked about that at the time uh, will be of benefit to you. Thank you, Paul. I guess we all need to get our magnifying glasses to read the fine print. Rochelle, question for you. What is frustration and how does that impact contracts? Frustration is a legal term and it's gonna be one of a few that we discuss today. So hopefully while we go through our legal jargon, we also provide you with an understanding of what exactly um, you need to know as you consider this from the aspect of grain contracts. So frustration refers to an event that occurs after the contract is entered into, but it makes the contract impossible to perform. And if frustration has occurred, then the, that party would be relieved of their obligations under the contract. And to amount to frustration, this event must go to the core of the contract and it must not be something that was contemplated in the contract. So considering this year's drought, something that might come up as a question for us is, does this amount to frustration would be a farmer couldn't deliver their grain because they had no crop to harvest because of the drought. Uh, but it's not just as simple as that, as saying, I had no crop, is this frustrated? If, you know, do I have to pay all these penalties or fees or anything? And the doctrine of frustration can only be considered where the contract doesn't include a force majeure provision, which is another one of those legal terms that Glenn will get into later on. And the contract must not otherwise contemplate a seller's inability to deliver grain due to environmental conditions. So this would be, you know, such as an act of God clause or a discount schedule for differing grades of grain. So as I go through this, I hope you're kind of getting the sense that frustration can be difficult to argue or be successful on. And it all depends upon the wording of your specific contract and the type of contract, you know, is this a production contract? Are we talking about deferred delivery contract? And at the end of the day, you may require a resolution through the courts if you wanted to maintain that position that the contract has been frustrated. So if anyone is wondering if their specific contract may be frustrated, I would recommend that they reach out to their lawyer for them to review the specific language of their contract. And then you can assess from there whether or not the contract could be frustrated or what your options might be going forward. Thank you, Rochelle, for that explanation and clarification. Paul, in 2013, the parliament amended the Canadian Grains Act to include arbitration for disagreements on delivery dates. Do panelists have any comments on the parameters of these provisions? Has this been utilized and what are the parameters of that? 
thank you. So the the amendments to the Grains Act regarding arbitration on delivery dates, um, I I personally have not seen it used. Uh, probably not in. I, I haven't dealt with a situation where it was used. Um, I'm sure it has been. Uh, I would defer to the comments of Rochelle and Glenn if they have additional experience with those actual amendments in practice. Um, what I know is the amendments require at one party's request, they can have the, uh, the Grain Commission act as arbitrator in the event of a dispute over delivery terms or dates. Um, some sort of criticisms of the amendments that I've heard would be related to, well, do you really want to escalate that to arbitration? Um, on that specific term, if, you know, sometimes you can work it out with the company and try not to burn the bridge. I have heard uh, several, um, several people speak to the, to the effect of, well, practically, how does that, how does that help us? I mean, we don't want to necessarily burn the bridge with, with a company or an individual person they're working with, uh, you know, if there's only a few buyers around. Uh, the next time they come there and try to deal with a person, it's a general hesitation against um, litigation, I think, for sort of the personal relationship reason. Um, I know in terms of practical effect, uh, I know the contracts, I think that some I've seen have sort of attempted to deal with this in terms of providing terms that extend the delivery date um, quite extensively in favor of the buyer sometimes um, if the initial delivery period you know, if they're unable to take the grain. So that's one way of sort of contractually trying to get around those provisions even being triggered. Uh, but I do think, you know, uh, just in terms of providing that option at the party's request, it's not mandatory, but it's optional. Uh, it's, it's kind of a good tool to have in the toolkit. Uh, is it, you know, you may run into a situation where it could be the absolute, you know, strategic or best, best thing to do to settle a dispute. So, um, I think there's pros and cons, but I have uh, I, I haven't heard of it being used widely in terms of arbitration. I think a lot of arbitration we see uh, a lot of grain contracts saying if there's going to be an arbitration, it's got to go through the NGFA, the National Grain and Feed Administration. So, um, but that all being said, I can, kind of speaking from my personal experience on that here. So, if Glenn or Rochelle have experience or comments on on that issue as well, certainly happy to defer to them. It's uh, just Glenn speaking up. I did have a chance to just quickly look at the legislation before the call. And, and as I read, uh, there's two types of arbitration that are available. One is uh, by joint request of the parties uh, on a grain contract. And then there's another one where either party can seek arbitration, uh, but it's in respect of a, 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 a grain company that doesn't accept delivery of uh, grain uh, on during the designated delivery period. Uh, there's a provision in the legislation which requires or which enables uh, uh, a penalty to be assessed against the, uh, the grain company, uh, which would be the licensee. And so that could be referred to arbitration, but I didn't find anything else that uh, related to you know, arbitration of other matters. Um, sort of my general comment in arbitration is that it, Sometimes it's done because it's quick and it's private. Uh, so, um, so that can be a benefit. Uh, I don't find that it's going to be less expensive because uh, you end up having to actually pay everybody to attend and participate. You may have to hire a venue. You may have to pay, well, you'll likely have to pay the arbitrator. So, um, so in some respects, uh, 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 the advantage is quickness and, and uh, privacy, but, uh, I don't know if there are other benefits. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Some buyers have been attempting to formalize contracts through perceived oral agreements. What are the legal principles of this and how can producers protect themselves? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, generally speaking, contracts can be formed either verbally or in writing. And, you know, whether your contract is oral or in writing, um, there has to be this meeting of the minds. And so, in other words, the contracts can be enforceable as long as all those required elements 
are in place. And um, when we're talking about these required elements, there needs to be an intent to contract. And there needs to be an agreement on what we call all essential terms. And considering grain contracts, we're looking at who the parties are, who's the buyer, who's the seller, you know, what's the price? Do we have a, a date of delivery? What's the volume? What's the quality? What's the type of grain? And when we're talking about these essential terms, they have to be sufficiently certain. And so where there is no written agreement and oral grain contracts need to have the following. So like I said, this all essential terms. And so this would be why when you're on a call with a buyer, they often have that script at the end because they want to make sure that they've talked about all essential items. And then there also needs to be clarity whether this agreement is conditional on their review and approval of a written agreement that's going to be signed or whether the buyer and seller are simply documenting this oral agreement. And when you take a look at a grain contract, this is often why many of them include specific language that indicates that there is an existing verbal agreement in place. And so when we consider these essential terms and whether or not this needs to be reduced to writing or not, a court or the law would also consider whether a reasonable bystander, so another farmer who's you know, listening to this conversation would think that there was an agreement made between the buyer and the seller. And so while this seems to be an informal process entering into agreements over the phone, the courts have been clear that this can amount to an agreement. And the similar approach has been taken for text messages and emails. So it always does, it, it doesn't need to be that formal written agreement. So when we're talking about oral agreements, um, the law, like I said, doesn't require it be in writing, but it does prefer it. And when we look at the, the Sale of Goods Act, which applies to grain contracts, and so where we've had this meeting of the minds, if you're looking to the legislation, it would only be enforced if there's at least one of three factors present. So that would need to be where the buyer has accepted partial delivery of the grain or has acted in any way to recognize this pre-existing contract or where the buyer gave something to in earnest to bind the contract such as a partial payment or where the contract is in writing. So while I've just gone over and said that there can be these oral agreements, if the contract does remain unsigned, it could be difficult for a court to enforce it so that's why many grain contracts have those arbitration clauses in place. And so as Glenn alluded to, this can be done privately and rather than outside the courts. And uh, there is often an organization named in these arbitration clauses. So I'm not sure if you want me to go into that right now but I can, it's just that the long and short of it is to you know, read the fine print when you're reviewing a contract or the written confirmation of the contract you've received after you've made a deal because those phone calls can amount to an agreement that you are gonna be bound by, so. Perfect, thank you very much, Glenn. Many grain contracts contain penalty provisions often referred to as administration fees. Our understanding is that penalty provisions should, shouldn't exist in contracts. Would you be able to discuss the principles behind this and what producers should do if they're being asked to pay these? Yes, uh, thank you. So um, when we're dealing with uh, penalties, um, the, the basic uh, starting point is that 
the courts, uh, the superior courts, like the Court of Queen's Bench in Saskatchewan, where a dispute of this nature would be uh, governed, are, are courts of equity. And so uh, they have the ability not to enforce uh, provisions in a contract which they would view as inequitable or unconscionable. And um, uh, a penalty is one of those uh, things that courts will not enforce. It's more in the realm of criminal law or quasi-criminal law where you're fined if you fail to do something and then that again is the government or a regulatory body that's uh, part of the government that would issue or criminal law. So courts of equity will not enforce, you know, penalties, they'll not enforce uh, things that are contrary to public policy or if there's something in a contract that provides for a party exercising discretion and they can do it arbitrarily or unreasonably, uh, courts view that as unconscionable and will not enforce it. Now, having said that, um, there is a concept in law which is enforceable and that is that parties to a contract can agree uh, to uh, liquidated damages and many grain contracts will in fact contain a provision that says that it's difficult for the parties to assess what the damages would be if a producer fails to deliver so that they uh, then introduce a liquidated damage uh, clause which is enforceable provided that the liquidated damage clause is a genuine pre-estimate of the actual damages it can't be something that's arbitrary if it is the courts would view it as a penalty and then the whole contract uh, becomes void and unenforceable so, um, so what you'll see in many contracts is a provision that tries to uh, assess what the damages would be for failure to deliver. And the most common uh, uh, test or formula that I've seen in these contracts is they'll just basically say that the producer has to pay the difference between uh, what uh, the contract price is and the market price at the time of the breach uh, to replace the grain. Uh, and those types of provisions are generally enforceable uh, because that would be uh, uh, an estimate of, of the cost to get out of it. Now, having said that, uh, one needs to be careful in the contract. If you're going to have a liquidated damage provision, it should be your exclusive remedy. Uh, if it isn't uh, the exclusive remedy of the uh, licensee, which would be the, the grain company, it could be viewed as a penalty because if you're reserving your right to claim other damages, you know, then if you're collecting the liquidated damages and, and still open up, uh, the producers open up to other kinds of damages, they may, the courts might view the liquidated damage clause as a penalty, thereby voiding the whole contract. So it would be important to have a look at a liquidated prov uh, damages provision to see if it is enforceable whether it's a genuine pre-estimate of the damages, whether it's reasonable, whether it's an exclusive remedy. Uh, otherwise, uh, it could be viewed as a penalty and the courts of equity uh, could uh, deem the contract to be unenforceable. Some contracts try to get around uh, uh, making the whole contract void by including a provision in the contract that's saying that if any part of the contract is found to be illegal or unenforceable, only that provision is um, removed from the contract and the rest of the provisions uh, continue to be binding on the parties. So um, one has to sort of read the contract to understand uh, what, um, what, what uh, the uh, grain company is attempting to do. But clearly if there's just an administrative uh, uh, fee and it's not um, uh, reasonable, and it's not a genuine pre-estimate, it's just arbitrary, it could be viewed as a penalty and the courts will could throw the whole contract uh, out. So that in a nutshell is sort of uh, how that provision works and, and um, uh, sort of workarounds. Thank you, Glenn. Another one for you, Glenn. Many contracts contain a force majeure clause and schedule, but producers have have still had to pay huge buyout and admin fees. Would you be able to explain the legal pro pro proceedings of force majeure and injustum generis? Some Latin terms that I can't, can't yeah. hardly pronounce. <laughs> well, uh, uh, as, as was previously alluded to, there are certain concepts in law that allow or excuse performance. Um, 
if the contract doesn't have a force majeure provision, then uh, you have to look at uh, whether a contract is impossible to perform or frustrated. Uh, those concepts are, I think, generally narrowly interpreted by the courts and uh, are, are difficult to, to um, apply to contracts and, and determining whether, in fact, the apply can be difficult. So parties often uh, uh, put in a provision which is a force majeure uh, clause in an agreement, uh, which is, I think, uh, actually a French word for like superior force. Uh, and uh, they identify reasons why performance is excused. And during the period while performance is excused, the contract will you know, continue in abeyance until you're able to perform. Uh, these kinds of con uh, these types of provisions are 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 varied and and broad, and not all force majeure provisions provide you with the um, uh, protection that you would want. Um, I know that um, uh, many years ago, uh, when grain companies entered into um, uh, grain contracts with producers, they often put in uh, a force majeure provision for special crops. Uh, which at the time were sort of new crops in development like, you know, lentils or chickpeas or peas or other kinds of uh, grains that weren't common. And um, uh, in order to get the protection, uh, it's important to look at the wording. So um, the two of the, the most common uh, considerations would be uh, an act of God. Uh, you know, does a drought uh, like this year, constitute an act of God, and if, if it is in this force majeure clause, does it protect a producer? Uh, well, there's been quite a bit of um, judicial interpretation of acts of God, and basically uh, what the courts have defined it, even uh, up at the Supreme Court, is it's an extraordinary occurrence, uh, could not have been foreseen, and it could not be guarded against. So, um, if a contract just as acts of God are an excuse to performance, uh, the question becomes, you know, does a drought constitute an act of God? And I think that from a grain company's perspective, they would view it as not, because if you're a farmer, uh, uh, you would know uh, that drought and hail and frost and too wet and all these other things are foreseeable events and would not constitute an, a, an act of God. Now, there's the other argument that uh, maybe the, they occur so rarely that it, it isn't foreseeable, but, uh, but generally, um, if you want the protection for specific uh, circumstances, you, you're best to actually list them in the contract. So another provision uh, that you'll often see is when they talk about weather events, you know, the typical clause that's uh, often in a contract will just say, you know, natural disasters such as floods or earthquake or hurricane or tornado or tsunami or other uh, serious weather event. And the question is, well, does that help us? And um, this is when this it just an, a generous rule comes into play. So what the courts have said is that if you list a whole bunch of weather events as um, a giving you relief from performance, the courts will interpret uh, the general language, like you know, other weather events, narrowly to say that it has to be of the same type and kind as the as the as the uh, events that you've described. So, in the typical force majeure clause, which talks about floods and earthquakes and hurricanes, you know, those uh, would not; uh, those are sort of events where you have like torrential rain and and storms. So drought, I don't think would, would really uh, fall within the parameters of that, even if there's some broad language to say other severe weather events, because it would be restricted by the description of the events that uh, preceded. Uh, so, um, so that's just uh, uh, something to be mindful of as to how those two clauses work. Um, so uh, the best type of force majeure clause would be one where you would say any event which is beyond my control, and I would, if I was a producer, strike out any language that says that is not foreseeable because events like drought or hail or frost or other things may very well be foreseeable. So you'd want to have start off with some 
broad general language. And then you would specifically want to identify uh, to protect uh, yourself, you know, events that are real, like frost or hail or drought or other uh, things that are practical, like the, the type of description that is in a normal clause, uh, usually those type of events don't occur in Saskatchewan, you know, unless you're in, in certain places where they have had flooding, but, but <laughs> like around uh, the, the Quill Lakes. So, um, so that's just something to be mindful of is that uh, uh, the clauses um, uh, have to be read to determine, you know, whether they actually protect you. The best way of protecting you is to start off broadly and then use the others by, uh, as an example, but say, you know, words that broaden it by saying whether these events are similar or dissimilar or these events without limiting the generality of the term, uh, that will help the producer. Uh, so some other things that uh, are important when it comes to um, uh, force majeure and also uh, when you can rely on it, it's typical in a force majeure clause to say uh, you're relieved in this circumstance, but it often comes with conditions. And so the conditions imposed will be that if you're going to rely on this event, you have to notify the counterparty to the contract that, that this event has arisen. So for example, this year, if even if there was something in the contract that said the drought was a was a, a circumstance which would relieve release you from or relieve you from delivery, if you were aware of that in in June or July, you can't wait until like uh, when the contract delivery period is uh, in in October to raise it. You'll have to raise it early on, and uh, that allows. Uh, you know, the counterparty to take other measures to protect itself. Uh, sometimes also what there is in these contracts is that if this event arises, uh, there's an obligation imposed on the producer to mitigate uh, the, the um, uh, losses that everyone will have. And so what that means is that it, in addition to uh, telling the counterparty, you have to actually that you, you won't be able to deliver because of drought. Uh, you may be required to take action to, to reduce the cost and expense to everyone by actually going into the market and acquiring uh, grain, uh, you know, before the price becomes $20 a bushel for canola. It might, you might be able to buy it at 15 at that time to hedge uh, uh, your losses. So, um, so that's how these clauses work. Uh, they're there to, uh, identify for the parties when performance is going to be excused. Um, it can be, it, you know, generally sometimes it, it's, it has to be sort of a supernatural event. It can't be foreseeable. And you can't control it or take steps to uh, control it. Uh, but other, but sometimes you can add things that are foreseeable and also include them as a release, as a as a, a provision or a, a circumstance when you're released of um, your delivery obligation, such as by identifying specifically, you know, frost or drought or that sort of thing. So that's how the, how the force majeure clauses work. Um, uh, it's best to identify uh, what it is that you want to be released uh, or relieved from. And uh, to the extent that there are circumstances which may arise uh, you want to use very broad language to ensure that you're not caught by this justum generis rule, which would say we're limited to the types of uh, circumstances that you've identified. So that's really how that provision works. It's there uh, basically to give people a roadmap of, of when they can, uh, uh, you know, delay delivery. Uh, often, if uh, there's one additional point I can raise is often in a force majeure clause, uh, uh, if it just says you're released from delivery obligations until the event no longer uh, exists, you know, that from a producer standpoint might mean, well, that's next fall when I have a crop. Um, so uh, a grain company may not like that idea so that they may put a, a provision in a force majeure uh, clause saying that if you fail, if the event continues to last for a month or two or three months, you know, then we have the right to terminate the contract. So that's just one additional consideration. Thank you for that, Glenn. Paul, 
In the summer of 2021, the Western Canadian wheat growers obtained a legal brief on the enforceability of grain contracts. Can't note some of the following legal concepts. Contra pro ferentum and jurisdiction. Would you be able to provide some context on what these mean and how important and how they are important when in parenting contracts, interpreting contracts? Uh, yes, contra pro ferentum is just kind of a old Latin way of saying um, if, a, if a contractual provision is either ambiguous or capable of more than one meaning, um, it is, if it's drafted in a way that is not certain, open to multiple interpretations, then the court's interpretation of that provision would be, it would be interpreted to the detriment of whoever wrote it. Um, so in this context, uh, in grain contracts, situation where the contract would be drafted by the producer, but I think in almost all cases, they're drafted by the, uh, by the buyers. Um, so if a dispute arose over a term in those contracts uh, that was capable of more than one interpretation, um, and, and that can be many different types of clauses, it's not necessarily limited to one type or another, it could be, you know, the language of an act of God clause, as, uh, as Glenn has described, or maybe one of the more, more central terms uh, required in the contract, um, you know, delivery dates, um, pricing grade, you don't often see it in those ones, but, uh, but there are, it, it can literally be open to any one. But um, if, if the concept of contra proferentum is invoked by either party, which mostly cases here, it would be by the producer. Um, and if the court validated that, that request, uh, then the contract would be interpreted or that clause uh, in favor of the producer and not the buyer on the assumption that it, or yeah, on the assumption that it was the, the grain company that drafted it. Um, so in most cases, I think the producer would have the advantage in terms of that being an option if, if a dispute arose over one of those clauses. Uh, I think one of the factors a court would look at in whether to validate a contra proferentum claim would be whether there is an acknowledgement or at least a circumstance over whether uh, whether the producer is acknowledging in the contract that they had time to uh, seek legal advice or obtain independent legal advice on signing the contract before they did. I think that's one of the relevant factors, um, but that's the long and the short of contra proferentum. Um, and it can be, you know, it, you, you can kind of Google examples of, of situations where uh, ambiguous court or ambiguous contract clauses have been litigated and it comes down to sometimes, you know, a grammar, uh, a misplaced or missing comma um, that can, you know, swing the meaning of an entire clause one way or another. So in a very nerdy legal context, it's, it's very interesting how precise uh, <laughs> I think lawyers need to be uh, when drafting those clauses or any clause. Um, and contra proferentum is one thing that could come back to, to haunt the, the drafting party. Um, re regarding jurisdiction, um, I think one thing, you know, not always, the, not, something that not always comes to the party's minds when making a contract, but is certainly open, them, open to them to agree on is jurisdiction. Um, it is open to the parties negotiating a private contract to uh, determine if there's a dispute, where and under whose rules they want to decide the dispute. So you might sign a contract in Saskatchewan, but agree and agree that uh, the uh, any disputes could be heard under the laws of Alberta if you wanted to. That's open for you to decide. Uh, most of the times you don't necessarily see that. A lot of the times it's uh, usually there's a clause in the contract uh, deferring the dispute to the court of the province in which the contract is signed, or it'll usually list it specifically. So you'll uh, see the clause that states, uh, in an event of dispute, uh, all disputes shall be determined by the laws in accordance with the province of Saskatchewan. And it can be as simple as that. Um, specifically in, with grain contracts, uh, this is where 
uh, as Glenn kind of alluded to earlier, the arbitration context comes in as to, I think the big decision on jurisdiction and forum is, do you want the courts to resolve disputes or do you want private arbitration? And, uh, you know, the pros and cons of arbitration, uh, Glenn alluded to, of course, uh, um, one, one significant one, or at least more common arbitration uh, that we see in grain contracts specifically is um, the clause requiring any disputes to be resolved by the NGFA, the National Grain and Feed Administration, which is a uh, trade group uh, based in Washington, DC. Now, they also have their own kind of set of rules. So a lot of what we see in terms of grain contracts in Saskatchewan and presumably elsewhere uh, are geared at utilizing those rules um, where you know, it formally recognizes, uh, for example, some of the NGFA specific rules formally recognize that you know, an oral contract with the copy of the, you know, a written copy of the oral agreement sent out within a short time after to the other party uh, they'll enforce that contract unless the party receiving the terms and conditions have uh, notified the other party that they disagree or they dispute that that's what was agreed to. Uh, so there are a few very green contract specific rules that the NGFA has. Um, and those can be, you know, to your benefit or detriment, depending on the particular situation, but they are an organization that offers arbitration services to its members and clauses in grain contracts, either requiring or providing the option of arbitration with the NGFA uh, are quite common. And obviously the importance of that clause is quite huge. If there is a disagreement and you know you naturally wanna proceed through the courts, perhaps the contract says it actually has to be done through the NGFA and then the other party could, could object and say you're proceeding down the wrong forum, which in the end could have cost you time and money and, and stress on top of that. So it's, uh, you know, I think to, to people entering into contracts, it's sometimes not something at the top of your mind, but it is quite important. And most contracts and most grain contracts will contain a term addressing forum and jurisdiction. Thank you, Paul. I'd also like to thank Western Wheat Growers for, you know, putting together that brief and taking the time to, you know, also work on an issue that's so important to all of us. Glenn, some producers have already paid out hundreds of thousands of dollars in bio fees and administration fees. Is there still an opportunity for them to find a legal solution? Not very easily. <laughs> it reminds me of a, of a, a, a judge in a case where uh, someone had performed a contract and then wanted a, a declaration that they weren't bound by it. And and the judge basically said that, you know, it, it's very difficult for someone to say after they've run a, a race and lost to say that, <laughs> that they weren't in the race. <laughs> so, uh, so it's, it, uh, you know, there may be ways of getting around it. Uh, they'd be very difficult and you'd need, uh, you know, a litigator to advise you. But some of the things that, you know, obviously come into to mind are if, if there was fraud involved, or if there was a mistake, uh, or if the contract is illegal or void, you might be able to claim that, uh, that you can uh, uh, recover um, amounts that were paid because of those circumstances. Uh, it's a complicated issue and it would require quite a bit of research to find out in what circumstances the court would intervene. But, but generally, uh, the counterparty to the contract will basically say to the extent that there was a problem with the contract by virtue of the fact that you performed it, you know, you've waived any particular uh, uh, breach or other problem with it uh, so that it would be very difficult. Uh, you know, what I've done in other circumstances where there's pressure to settle up with the contract, but you want to retain your legal remedies, uh, you can make a payment uh, to a counterparty in a contract uh, under protest. And, um, and what that means in law is that you're paying it, uh, you're protesting your obligation to pay it, and you're reserving your right to assert any and all legal uh, uh, remedies available uh, to you. So that is one uh, thing to do. But if you haven't sort of paid things under protest, uh, 
uh, you know, there's always the issue of whether if there was a problem, you've waived it by your conduct, uh, although certain things like fraud and mistake uh, and just illeg illegality, uh, you know, could uh, help uh, you to recover the amounts, but it would be a difficult, uh, difficult position to take, I think. Thank you. Another one for you, Glenn. Some grain buyers have been attempting to get producers to sign consent judgment decrees. Would you be able to explain what these are and provide advice for those being pressured to sign these as well as for those that have already signed? Sure, so uh, when I was a young lawyer, I did a lot of uh, collections work. And so what happens in collections often is that someone owes money to someone else, but they're not able to pay the, uh, the amount you know, in one lump sum, they may say, well, I'll need a year or I need like two years or some uh, period of time. And so, uh, you know, they ask the other party for the concession to give them time to pay. So what the other party doesn't want is a situation to arise where, where the fellow doesn't pay and then you have to sue them and they enter a defense uh, and then you're into a big long legal battle. So what, uh, someone like a grain company might do to, if there was a large amount owing and they're gonna give you like 18 months to settle it, they would say, well, what we're going to do is we're gonna commence an action in debt against you for the amount uh, that, uh, that we've settled for. Um, uh, we will uh, uh, require you to consent to us entering a judgment. We won't take it out for default or get a writ of execution, which is a sort of, a, um, crystallizing it, but that way that if you default in your payment obligation, you know, we're not into a lawsuit with you where you're raising, you know, a whole bunch of defenses. You basically agreed that we, that, that you owe us this amount. And if you default, we can then take enforcement proceedings. Uh, now there's a benefit to a producer, uh, uh, of going this road sometimes if they can get the time to pay it, because if an action you're just consenting to a judgment. It, it doesn't form a judgment, and it may not, uh, or it's unlikely to affect your credit rating. If um, there was a judgment against you, it might affect your credit rating, your ability to get extra credit or additional credit, or it may result in your bank or other lender, you know, calling in a credit facility. So it's a it's a method of of uh, just ensuring that there will be no legal proceedings. That if you default uh, in your promises to pay over time you know, then we can proceed with getting a judgment and taking enforcement proceedings. So that's really what, what that's all about. It's just uh, that the counterparty doesn't want to have the effort of fighting a legal battle down the road if you don't meet your payment obligations over a, uh, you know, a fixed payment plan. Thank you. Rochelle. In APAS's recent survey, approximately 25% of producers were, not, were unable to contact their grain buyer when they knew that they wouldn't be able to fulfill their contract. What is the obligation of communication between contracting parties? This was actually quite surprising to see on the list. And uh, I wouldn't say it's an obligation, but it's an important business principle, regardless of the type of contract, that the parties maintain good communication with the other party both before signing any agreement and during the life of the contract. And it's also crucial for producers to be familiar with the notice provisions in the green contracts. And depending on the specific contract, it may specifically outline how and when you need to inform the buyer. And if you, you know, if you're unable to fulfill any of your obligations under the contract, and you know, if there ends up being a communication issue, which it sounds like there there might have been to for 25% of producers, is that you they'll need to be able to show that they made a genuine attempt to comply with the notice provisions in the contract. And if you need to get a hold of the buyer and you haven't had any success contacting them through any specific method outlined in the contract or a specific method wasn't outlined, then try contacting them with, you know, be it by phone, text, or email in the same manner that you used at the time of forming the contract. And 
you know, unless you've been informed by the buyer otherwise, you know, such as an individual no longer being with the company, then it would be reasonable from our perspective to try and contact the buyer using the same phone number or email address used in prior communications. And if the seller is unable to contact the buyer, you know, despite making these legitimate attempts to do so, you know, using common sense communication techniques or fulfillment of those notice provisions, you know, it makes it difficult for the seller to fulfill the notice requirements or, you know, discuss mitigation or resolution efforts. And, you know, based on these attempts and any non-contact by the buyer, it may not be reasonable for the farmer to be found at fault. And, you know, if they were, for whatever reason, not making contact with the seller for a period of time. And, you know, this is to the detriment of the buyer for them to not to communicate. And it's also not good for maintaining good relationships. So this is why it came up as such a surprise. You'd think they'd want to, to talk to the, the farmers and uh, come to a resolution. Thank you. That's all the formal questions we had. Is there any questions from the floor? I see we have one on Zoom that I will ask, but I'll ask just from the floor, from the audience here, are there any questions for our panelists? We have a couple people coming to the mic. Go ahead, Wayne. Wayne Bacon, RM430. I guess the question I have for you is a lot of farmers try to get out of their contracts last July, late June sort of, but mostly in the beginning of July because we knew there was a major problem coming. Uh, a lot of the grain companies basically said at that time they wanted to wait and see what we got because they wanted to make sure they got the grain that we did have and were willing to work with us later on to uh, clear, get out of that contract. And they either said they were either going to roll it or work with us somehow, but that never happened. They waited till the grain prices got up to as high as it could get and then they decided that they, they want their money. And that's where I have a major problem with these contracts. more of a statement, Wayne, than a question. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not a litigator, but I can, I can, you know, raise a couple of things and maybe the others can sort of pipe in. So, so if, if a producer, uh, you know, tells a, a buyer that, uh, that they anticipate not being able to deliver, it's sort of like, uh, it's an anticipatory breach. And so then that uh, I think creates some obligation on, on the counterparty, which is the buyer to mitigate uh, their losses. And um, you know, what is reasonable in the circumstance, uh, whether they should be out pricing grain to replace that or whether the producer should be doing that um, or whether they can just wait, it's, it's really a question of fact. But I think that you know, there are some, uh, you know, there is a concept uh, uh, in law of anticipatory breach and the obligations which arise from that. But I haven't done a lot of research to know like when it comes into play and what would be viewed as appropriate conduct. But I think that's, that's the, the issue that I see. Devin. Devin Walker, uh, RM472. Um, so I, a uh, question I have in your guys' experience as uh, legal advisors and counsel and such, um, in the past, prior to grain contracts, uh, the, the grain contract issues of late, uh, I've heard issues where producers have wanted to, I guess, uh, get, a, get a good lawyer and take the grain company or their buyer or whoever to task on a contract or a contract issue, but struggle to uh, get legal counsel because of uh, conflict of interest or arm's length work that many lawyers or even, um, uh, yeah, lawyers or, or, or groups have, have done in the past. They're on a retainer for a certain grain company or, 
they're currently working on another case and, it, and it's viewed as conflict of interest or within arm's length. Uh, is that is there any truth to that or or is it pretty open? Like what's the state of trying to find a good lawyer that isn't already involved on the other side of the coin? I can. Well, I think I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rochelle. Oh, no, yeah, go ahead. Well, that's fine, so. Oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say my piece and then I'll, I'll uh, switch the mic to you there. Um, I think all I, all I had to say on that is, um, I know our office, um, you know, even me personally, I've acted for uh, both green, green buyers and producers. Um, so, I mean, conflicts of interest, they are, they, they arise very commonly. Um, they do happen. So if, um, you know, sometimes I think firms, it might be a very specific conflict. It might be um, a little more loose in terms of a longstanding client, client where you have a very similar type of issue on the opposite end. Uh, not, not necessarily a true conflict, but one where uh, I think it would be someone could reasonably question your involvement in, uh, in a dispute. So I, I don't think, you know, I, I, to the extent that I detected some, some skepticism with the, the conflict of interest line, I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that's, that's the case. Um, conflicts do arise a lot, especially because there is a lot of agricultural related litigation in Saskatchewan. So often either firms or small and big offices are on uh, one, or, one or both sides of, of that issue. So I, I, I have heard that specific um, comment from, from others as well, that it's oftentimes on the producer side, it can be tough to, uh, you got to make several calls before you can locate someone. So I don't know if I can offer you a lot of recommendations other than there are a lot of people who do practice in this area and, you know, a lot of great capable lawyers out there if, if your first or even second call ends up in a conflict. Uh, but sorry to cut you off there, Rochelle, I will uh, uh, hand you the floor. No, that's all right. You uh, covered the, the same scope that I was going to. And, you know, only thing I maybe add to that is, you know, if you are feeling like you're hitting a wall there and everyone's getting back to you with that same answer that there is a conflict, uh, it wouldn't be offside to ask if we could recommend a, a couple names and you could give those individuals a try as we may have a, a better idea of the different lawyers that either practice more on one side or the other and may be able to, to help you find that uh, counsel to help you through it. Thank you. Jeremy. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little more to the uh, arbitration clauses that exist with regards to the NGFA. Um, I'm just kind of curious what the, I suppose, legal ramifications are of uh, them judging against you. It, how enforceable is it? What, uh, you know, what, uh, what happens after that? Is it still uh, an option of, of, of taking the contract uh, through, the, through the provincial court systems? Uh, I, I can probably offer a few comments on that, uh, subject to anything that Rochelle and Glenn might add as well. Um, I am fairly familiar with the NGFA, their rules of procedure and their process, and that is, like I said, one, one example of an arbitration outfit that is commonly used or commonly named in green contracts. Um, so the short answer is, yeah, their, their decisions, even though they're uh, sort of a trade organization based out of Washington, or I guess technically Arlington, Virginia, but uh, out of DC, um, their decisions are binding. They are legally enforceable and registrable in Saskatchewan, just essentially the same thing uh, as if a judgment against you uh, was issued by the court. Um, there is a bit of a process for taking the decision of the NGFA, having it uh, registered by a court or at, in court in Saskatchewan, and then it becomes uh, enforceable just like any other court decision. Um, on, so, and that's all provided that the NGFA process was either agreed upon by the parties or stipulated in the contract, which is just another way to say that the parties agreed to it. Um, oftentimes it, you know, it's in the, it's in the contract under the jurisdiction clause. 
And as long as one party, often the, the green buyer, uh, is the member of the NGFA and is kind of up to date with the registration fees, the NGFA will hear the dispute um, if it's stipulated by the contract. Uh, to the second, part, second portion of your question um, about whether you can still, you know, take the matter to, to the provincial courts or, uh, or another jurisdiction after, after it's heard by the NGFA and say they found against you, the answer is almost certainly no. Um, just based on the con or a concept called res judicata, basically once the parties agree to a certain forum, so if it's in, the, um, in your contract, that arbitration will be used, whether that's NGFA or otherwise. Once that arbitrator makes the decision, and you know, exhausting any of the appeals processes available through that that procedure, uh, once that happens, that is the final decision. And if you attempt to then uh, litigate the same dispute in a court, the other party will show up and waive their NGFA judgment uh, in the courtroom, and then likely apply to have it dismissed because it's already been decided. Uh, that's the sort of in broad brush strokes, the general principles that I hope answer your question. One more from the floor. Blair Cummins, RM of Blucher 343. I'm surprised to hear that anybody's having trouble finding a lawyer. I thought there was one under every rock, but uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we all need lawyers, but no, my question is quite simple. Uh, does a cooling off period exist uh, for grain contracts? Uh, I'm not sure it's Glenn speaking. Uh, what I, 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 if I understand what a cooling off period is, but I, I mean, if if you're asking whether there's flexibility in in the delivery uh, period, um, uh, uh, it depends on the contract. If it has a, you know, if there's a time of the essence provision and there's a, a you know, strict dates uh, or or. Um, uh, as to delivery, uh, I don't think that you can relax those uh, if there isn't a time of the essence provision. Uh, it, you may be able to relax the time for delivery, but um, you know I'm not sure if that's the the question that you have. There was a time consumer law kind of protected people from impulse buying, and you had a few hours to change your mind or a few days. And I'm wondering if such a thing is this, exists with these contracts. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I, uh, uh, that's more for direct sales uh, uh, contracts where you have door to door sales periods. So it wouldn't apply in, in, in this instance. Yes, I'm going to make an exception. Todd. <laughs> uh, Lewis, 128. Um, you know, as we've gone through this and through, uh, you know, producers' comments and so on, we've had lots of ideas around the concept of a standardized contract. Uh, you know, the machinery, what happens with machinery uh, currently in Saskatchewan, you know, there's provincial legislation that, that uh, when you buy a piece of equipment, you're signing a standard contract. Um, that kind of concept is it something that could be applicable, you know, to grain grain buying, and would it be uh, provincial legislation or federal, or is it shared, or how's that? Those those uh, if we want to put a concept like that forward, would it go through provincially or federally? I think it would be uh, governed by the Canada Grain Act, and that's a federal legislation. So I think that's probably where would be um, my initial reaction, although there might be something that has joint jurisdiction, so there may be some ability to deal with it provincially, but I think, you know, grain contracts and grain deliveries are, are dealt with under the Canada Grain Act, which is federal legislation. Is it a quick question? Yeah, real quick. Real quick. Okay. We're already over. Uh, Chris, Chris McPherson, 123. My question is on, uh, say, fertilizer this spring, a lot of these retailers are saying, you know, might not be available in the spring, might not be able to get it. And we all kind of think that's more of just a sales to get it home and then you're being at a higher price. So say it does happen and they, they don't get the fertilizer and we've already prepaid at say $1,200 a ton. And we now have to go across the road to the different retailer and pay $1,800 a ton. Will it work? Like, do we have a... a, a illegal to say, hey, you guys got to pay the difference just like we have to on a grain contract? 
I just curious on that. Well, I think that if 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 the contract itself does not guarantee delivery, then I don't know that uh, that you would have a legal recourse. I mean, if they do accept your order uh, for a delivery period without any qualification or condition or or excuse, uh, you know, then you would. But but I'm thinking that if they're if they're telling you that they may not be able to deliver the, the paperwork, we'll probably have some provision in there excusing delivery uh, if uh, they're unable to procure the uh, the necessary supply from their suppliers. Again, you'd have to look at the contract to see if that excuse was built into the force majeure provision or some other provision. That's all the time we have. So I wanna take this time to thank you on behalf of APAS for speaking to us today on this very important issue. And, and I know that the information that you have given us today, we will, I'm sure lots of us will be using going forward. There is one question on the chat. If you guys would answer for us on there, that would be great. We have another another presentation coming up here today. So thank you very much for taking the time today to speak with us. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you for inviting us. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you for the invite.